during the previous times I was here, um, I told you guys a little bit about myself, um, the fact that I worked in education. I was a high school teacher for a num number of years. I was a high school principal for a number of years. Um, I just got my doctorate degree, and so all of that's been great. But when I was, when I was uh, younger, uh, the last thing that I wanted to do was be a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for 10 years. Um, when I was a teenager, that is the last thing that I wanted to become. Uh, my dad uh, was the pastor of our church for many, many years. And growing up in a pastor's household, um, you have a certain level of expectation. And <clears throat> a lot of time people in the church, like the older people in the church, they'd come up to me and they'd be like, uh, hey, Olus, are you going to be a pastor one day? Or are you going to be a preacher? Like, do you want to follow in your dad's footsteps? And I remember when they'd ask me, like, hey, do you want to be a preacher? I, I remember hearing that question and... Like, I'd always respond, you know, like, somewhat politely, like, oh, you know, I guess we'll see. But I always remember thinking to myself, like, no, I don't. Like, <laughs> I don't. I, I don't want to be a preacher. I don't. I have no interest in being a pastor. I, I have no interest in being involved in youth ministry. Um, I really enjoyed my life. Uh, I started college really young. I had a lot of great friends. Uh, and we were having the time of our lives. I was not interested in becoming a preacher uh, much less a pastor or getting like a degree in theology. Like that was the furthest thing from my mind. Like, no, why, why would I want to do that? I love my life. Why would I like pursue those things? Like maybe someone else, but not me. Honestly, sometimes like when young guys would come out and they would like preach, I'd be just like, I don't know, I'd kind of think that they were a little bit nerdy. And I just like, that was not for me. I was not interested in that. And that was my 17-year-old life. Um, I don't know about you, but I enjoy watching a, a good movie every once in a while. Um, the worst thing for me, this is the worst thing, and you can ask my wife, she'll fact check this. The worst thing for me is showing up to a movie mid-movie. Like after the movie has already started. Like you show up and the movie's already playing on the screen. I really don't like that. I don't like showing up mid-movie and, because then you have all of those questions, right? Like everybody's sitting there, they're like super engrossed in the film. And then like you walk in, you sit down on the sofa next to your friends and like they're all like super into it, watching it. And I'm like, what's happening? You know, like you, you always have those questions. Like who's he? Why does he not like him? Right? Like you always have, and you're always like whispering to your friend, like, why is he attacking him? Right? And everybody else is watching. And you have all of these questions. Right? You have all of these questions. Like, like, does she love him? Does she love him? Right? Like you're just sitting there whispering and whispering. And I hate when other people do that too. But like you walk in and you have no idea what's going on. But one thing you can be confident of that that scene is part of a bigger story. That that small little scene, those few seconds, are part of something bigger, greater, and more substantial. And that's what my life felt like at the age of 17. I was like, I like this, but honestly, I don't have any idea of where it fits in in this universe. I don't know where this fits in in the grand scheme of creation and life. I was questioning my purpose in life. I had no idea where I was going, but I was like, I like the scene, but I don't know what it means. I liked my life at 17, but I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what the purpose of life was. One thing I am sure of is that at the age of 17, I felt like the world revolved around me, right? Everything revolved around me. <laughs> it seemed like everybody else's lives revolved around mine too. It seemed like I was the center of the universe. You know, for thousands of years, uh, people believed that the earth was the center of 
the universe. Uh, there's this theory, it's called geocentric theory, and ancient scientists in Greece and in Rome, uh, they all believed it. And it's very simple, that everything revolves around us. Everything revolves around us. We're the main thing. And everything else is just a sideshow, right? All of the planets, the sun, everything else is just a sideshow, and we're the main thing. And there was this man that comes along. His name was Nicholas Copernicus. And essentially, he taps the world on the shoulder and says, hey, guys, uh, you actually have it all wrong. The sun is the center of the universe. It's not humanity. It's not the earth. It's not the world. And so he goes, ding, ding, ding. The sun is the center of the universe. And people didn't like that message. Right? People didn't like that message. Like, what do you mean? As important and as significant as we are, you mean to tell us that everything doesn't revolve around us? And honestly, that's what my encounter with God looked like at the age of 17. God tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Hey, Olis, life doesn't revolve around you. Life revolves around my son. Life revolves around Jesus. Life doesn't revolve around you. It doesn't revolve around, it doesn't re revolve around the things that you like, your hobbies, your interests, who you are, your pride, your ego. Life doesn't revolve around those things. Life revolves around my son. <clears throat> and that didn't really make sense to me. You know, I met Jesus, but... Uh, like most people that meet Jesus, uh, I still had a lot of pain. I still had a lot of problems. But one thing I was certain of is that I also had purpose. But God's love didn't really make sense to me at the age of 17. And um, I think a lot of people might be in that same boat. Uh, my wife and I, we've lived in Seattle for about 30 years. We haven't been married all those 30 years. We've been married for 10. And today is actually our 10-year anniversary. So tonight, yeah. <clears throat> you know, we were debating, like, how should we spend our 10-year anniversary? And we had a long list of things, like Hawaii, Mexico, Bethany Youth. And Bethany Youth was at the top. <laughs> and so that's why we're here tonight, celebrating 10 years of marriage here at Youth Service with you guys. But we lived in the Seattle area for about 30 years. Um, we met uh, when we were kids. We fell in love. And we've been married for 10 years now. Uh, we're actually in the process of moving to Texas, the greatest state in America. And so we're in the process of moving there. And I learned a super interesting fact about Texas. Texas is a pretty dry state, uh, right? I mean, you'll, you'll have your fair share of rains, but overall, Texas is a pretty dry state. But Texas is huge and home to so many people, millions of people. Seattle's a big city. Any big city in Texas is like three times bigger than Seattle. So, I mean, Texas is very, very big. And you know what else is big? Churches are big, yeah. Churches are big, the food's big, barbecue's big, people are big. I mean, people are actually really, like all the guys are really tall. So I'm six foot, like one and a half, six foot two. And uh, when I am in Texas, I'm not like the tall guy. In Seattle, I'm like one of the taller guys. When I'm in Texas, I'm like, the average guy, right? There are a lot of guys taller than me. And so a lot of big things. But let me tell you what else is big. Underneath Texas, underneath the crust of the earth is a really big well. And this well, it has a name. It's called the Edwards Aquifer. And this aquifer is where the majority of the people in Texas get their water. And essentially, this is how it works. They've sent uh, submarines into this aquifer. It's this massive well. And the submarines, they've measured how wide this well is. They've measured how long this well is. But to this day, in 2022, July 7, 2022, with all the advancements of science that we have today, there has not been yet a measurement of the depth of the Edwards Aquifer. One scientist said, I'm pretty sure it's unlimited. 
We sent submarines down there and they just get crushed under the pressure of water because it's so deep. We haven't found out how deep it is. And I realize that that's what God's love is to me. Like, the, like we know that it's wide. We know that it's long. We know that it's great. But you and I will never understand how deep God's love is for you and for me. We'll never understand it. We know it's this big. But we don't actually know how deep it goes. There's this really cool verse in the Bible that says even the angels are pondering. Like the angels are confused how God could love creation so much that he would send his son to die for it. Folks, I don't know about you, but like I can probably, you can probably find someone that would be willing to give their life for you. Right, because y'all are wonderful people. Y'all look great. I'm sure you can probably find someone to give their life for you. Right, if someone like deeply loves you, they'd probably be willing to give their life for you. But you will never find anyone that's willing to give their child for you. You'll never find anyone that's willing to give their child's life for you. And that's the love of God. And this passage in the Bible says that the angels look down on this and they have a hard time understanding it. What kind of God is this that loves the people of Sacramento so much that he'd give his child for them? Like, man, that's a big deal. That is such a big deal. And so, folks, I think it's pretty clear what God's love looks like towards us. What God's position is towards us. Now what does your love look like towards God? What does your love look like towards God? John chapter 6. John chapter 6, we're taking it from the top, verse 1. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw signs that he was healing the sick. And Jesus goes up on the mountain, and there he sits down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, it was at hand. And Jesus lifts up his eyes, and he looks around, and he says to his disciples, like, there are a lot of people here. And his disciples says, yeah, about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. That's thousands upon thousands of people. And Jesus says, do we have anything to feed them with? And they say, yeah, we have a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And Jesus says, bring them to me. They bring Jesus the fish and the loaves. He lifts them up. The Bible says he gives thanks. And he begins to distribute them to all of the people that are gathered on the mountainside. And the Bible says that people ate until they had their fill. They enjoyed the meal. They had a great time hanging out with Jesus. It was awesome. They had such a cool evening. The Bible says the night comes and everybody goes to bed. Jesus wakes up really early and he walks on water across the sea. His disciples leave as well. The next morning, all of the people that are gathered on the mountainside, they wake up and they're hungry. They wake up and they're hungry. And they start asking each other, hey, where's Jesus? Did he open up the breakfast buffet yet? Where is Jesus? And they're confused because Jesus is nowhere to be found. And someone said, hey, Jesus is operating on the other shore. And they all follow him. And they show up and they find out that the buffet had closed. They show up and they say, hey, Jesus, we're here for you. And Jesus says, you're not here for me. The only reason you're here is because of what I've done for you. The only reason that you're here is because of the gifts that I gave to you. The only reason that you're here is because your bellies are hungry and you need something from me. And they sat there confused. Like, Jesus, what do you mean? Like, Jesus, what do you mean? Every single relationship, every single couple... 
a short while into dating has an important conversation. It's called the DTR conversation. DTR stands for define the relationship. If you're a boy and you've ever dated a girl, there was probably a moment in your relationship where she sat down with you and said, hey, buddy, listen, where's this going? Like, hey, pal, what does this mean? I mean, A, if she's calling you pal, she's probably not that into you, but that's not what we're talking about. The point is, she's like, hey, man, <laughs> I don't know what your girlfriend calls you. The point is, she says, hey, where's this going? What does this mean? Like, you've been talking to me for a while. You've expressed interest in me a couple of times. Like, you've asked me out for coffee. Like, all of that's been great. But are you ready to make a decision? Are you ready to make a decision to be committed to me? Like, are you in this for me or just because you're having a good time? Every healthy relationship has this conversation at some point. Define the relationship. A lot of us, we say our relationship with Jesus, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. But for a lot of us, it's actually become a religion. Like we just go through the motions. We show up once or twice a week. We'll lift up our hands. We'll listen to the sermon. That's all wonderful. We might even go to camp. But we're not personally intimate with the Lord. And so these people, they show up and they're like, hey, Jesus, where's the bread and the fish? And he said, hey, if you're looking for bread, I'm the living bread. Whoever eats of my flesh will never be hungry again. He says, whoever drinks of my blood will never be thirsty again. And essentially, he says, who's ready to commit? Who's ready to follow me? Who's ready to give their life for me? Who's ready to give up everything for me? Who's ready to go? Like, who's ready to go? And it says in John chapter 6, verse 66, and many of his disciples left him. Many of his disciples left him. When things got tough, when things got a little bit uncomfortable, when things started to feel a little unpleasant, when the commitment got too great, when the commitment got too big, they said, you know what, Jesus, we're not really here for all that. I mean, you're right, we're here for the stuff that you can give us. We're not really here for you. We're not really here for you. And that's what a lot of Christianity in America looks like today. For me, it's Jesus plus health. Jesus plus money. Jesus plus a good job. Jesus plus all the other things. If I get all the other stuff, then I'm a sold out Christian. If I get all of the other things, then I'm a sold out Christian. And you know what the result is? We miss the main thing. We miss out on the main thing. And the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So one time my wife tells me, she says, hey, Olas, can you go to Costco and get some milk? And uh, I love Costco, so I said, amen, I'll go to Costco and get some milk. And I remember that day very vividly. I get into the SUV and I drive down to Costco. And I remember, like, you don't go to Costco <clears throat> when you need something. You go to Costco and let Costco tell you what you need. And so I came to Costco that day, and I remember walking right through the door, and I saw the most beautiful vacuum. It was an awesome vacuum. I mean, it was like, it was like the Mercedes-Benz of vacuums. And I just stood there admiring it. There were a couple of people standing there looking at it. And one guy grabbed the box, second guy grabbed the box, and I was like, uh-uh, and I grabbed the third box. And I remember walking through the store, and uh, I saw another vacuum. And that one was like the Porsche of vacuums. So I actually bought that one, too. And I kept walking through the store, and I got a bunch of groceries, and I had a really, really good shopping trip, and it was awesome. And I come home, and uh, I, anytime I come home from Costco, I always call Viola as I'm pulling into the neighborhood. I'm like, hey, babe, can you help me, uh, like, unload the car? I want you to see everything I got. She's like, sure. And I even took a picture of this day because it was, like, so memorable for me. I open my trunk, and she's looking in the trunk, and the trunk is full, like, to the top. And the first thing she pulls out is two vacuums. I mean, we already had a vacuum at home, but now we had three. Pull out the vacuums, pull out a new coffee maker. There was a blender in there. There was like a bunch of barbecue. I mean, there was a lot of stuff. 
She's pulling it out, pulling it out, pulling it out. And there, there just comes this moment as we're reaching the end of cleaning out the trunk. And she stops and she says, where's the milk? I said, did you get the milk? And I kind of stood there for a second. Like, milk? There's more than milk. And I realized I didn't get the milk. <laughs> My entire purpose of going to Costco was to get the milk. That was the entire purpose of going to the store. It was to get milk. And I was shocked that I had forgotten the main thing. Friends, that's what a lot of our lives look like. That's what a lot of lives look like in general when they reach the end. It's like, man, I got the good job. I got the pretty car. I got the pretty girl. I got the pretty house. I got everything I need. But a lot of those people, they don't get the main thing. They don't actually have a relationship with the Lord. Because they sat in services similar to this one. Like, yeah, man, this ain't for me. Like, I'm into Jesus. But do they actually know him? Do they really know him? Do they have a relationship with him? Or is it just a religion? Is it just something that they do? Is it just, is it just a part of their weekly schedule? Or is Jesus the lover of their soul? Man, I was standing there during worship. Hey man, we sang some beautiful words today. Like, I want to sit at your feet. Drink from the cup in your hands. Like, those are loving words. Those are some really special, powerful, beautiful words. But do they mean anything to you? Like, do you actually mean them when you sing them? Like, Jesus, I want to sit at your feet. I want to drink from the cup in your hand. And honestly, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what happens. I was telling the teen Bible school students, every two minutes, somebody in this world loses their life for Jesus. Every two minutes, somebody gets killed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, and we're just kicking it. We're just hanging out. We're just enjoying our lives. And there are brothers and sisters of mine and yours that are getting killed right now. In the next two minutes, somebody else is going to lose their life for the gospel. They're following Jesus. They're following Jesus. Can we all stand? Do we have our uh, keyboard player here still? I was playing the lovely keyboards today. If we don't, that's okay. If we do, oh, my man, praise God. Can we all just take a moment to close our eyes and bow our heads and just spend time just pondering over the presence of God? Can we just take a moment to do that together? Close your eyes with me. You can just pray to yourself quietly and just spend a few moments connecting with God. Just let this be just like a personal, quiet time of prayer for you where you just talk to the Lord, where you assess your relationship with Him, where you just spend some time talking with Him. If you haven't spoken with Him in a while, let this be a time where you can reconnect with Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, God. We bless you and we praise you. We thank you, God, for who you are, God. We thank you, Lord, for being a loving God, a merciful God, a God that cares for us. And Father, tonight, we just want to reconnect with you. Tonight, we just want to be visited by your precious spirit, by your precious by your precious beauty and your precious love and your precious power, God. 
We want to spend some time getting to know you, Lord. Re-getting to know you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We bless you and we praise you, God. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, God, I pray for the hearts that are distant from you. I pray, God, that tonight, whatever seed was planted, Lord, I pray, God, that it would bear fruit. I pray, God, that this would be a generation of young people that are deeply in love with you, that are ready to shake the world, that are ready to change nations, God. And we pray for this in your name. We pray for deep, genuine relationships with you. Relationships that are personal and intimate. Relationships that are special. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are here tonight that are burdened and are carrying heavy loads. I pray, God, that you would re relieve them of those burdens tonight. I pray, God, that they would be introduced to you this evening. That hearing about your immeasurable love, God, would have spoken to them tonight. And I ask for this in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you for being the Prince of Peace. We thank you for being the source of peace. Hallelujah, God, we speak against all anxiety tonight. We speak against all depression tonight. We speak against all fear tonight. Let your perfect love cast out all fear tonight in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, God. We ask that you would mend broken hearts tonight, Jesus. We ask that you would heal the sick tonight, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We bless you and we praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. My friend, Jesus doesn't just save. Jesus also sustains. Like Jesus gives you the ability to live. So he doesn't just save you. He also sustains you. But he doesn't just sustain you. So he doesn't just save you. He doesn't just sustain you. Jesus also can satisfy you. And so if you feel like you've been living life dissatisfied, unhappy, depressed, scared, afraid, living in fear, discouraged. Jesus is the source of all satisfaction. And allow him to be that satisfaction for you tonight. Allow him to just embrace you tonight. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in brokenness. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in any of those things. You can live in God's complete peace and joy. That's what he wants for you and that's what he's offering for you tonight. And all you have to do is receive it. All you have to do is just receive it. Just say, Jesus, I accept it tonight. Jesus, I receive it tonight. And it'll be yours. Peace like you've never imagined before. A calmness in your spirit like you've never imagined before. Relief from fear like you've never imagined it before. 43% of Americans are on antidepressants. They're taking pills because they're so depressed. They're so anxious. They're so afraid. That doesn't have to be you. You do not have to be a statistic. You can live in complete peace. That's what Jesus is offering for you tonight. And all you have to do is simply receive it. Just accept and say, Jesus, I'm here and I'm ready for it. Take my burdens, take my pain. And in exchange, I take you.